Chapter 29, Vital Signs. Measurement of vital signs will provide data to determine a patient's usual state of health or baseline data. The assessment of vital signs provides information to identify nursing diagnoses, implement planned interventions, and evaluate outcomes of care. Vital signs are a quick and efficient way of monitoring a condition or to identify problems and evaluate responses to interventions. The assessment of vital signs provides data on a patient's condition. When we look at the vital sign, it'll determine when, where, how, and by whom the vital signs are measured when determining the patient's condition. There are acceptable ranges for vital signs for adults. Average temperature, 98.6 to 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit, or 36 to 38 degrees Celsius. Pulse, 60 to 100 beats per minute, strong and regular. Pulse oximetry, the normal is an SpO2 greater than or equal to 95%. Respirations, 12 to 20 breaths per minute, deep and regular. Blood pressure, less than 120 millimeters of mercury systolic, which is the top number, and less than 80 millimeters of mercury diastolic or the bottom number. The pulse pressure, the average is 30 to 50 millimeters of mercury. Capnography, the normal CO2 level is 35 to 45 milligrams of mercury. Throughout this case study, think about Ms. Coburn's history and how it will affect her vital signs. There are ranges of normal temperature values and abnormal temperature alterations. Body temperature is the difference between the amount of heat produced and the amount of heat that is lost. It, despite the extremes in environmental conditions and physical activity, temperature controlled mechanisms of the human body maintain the core temperature and keep it relatively constant. Physiological and behavioral mechanisms regulate the balance between the heat loss and the heat produced. This is known as thermoregulation. The hypothalamus, which is located between the cerebral hemispheres, controls the body temperature. Mechanisms of heat loss include sweating, vasodilation of blood vessels, and inhibition of heat production. Heat is produced by the body as a byproduct of our metabolism. There are four different methods for heat loss, radiation, conduction, convection, and evaporation. Radiation. This is the transfer of heat from the surface area of one object to the surface area of another object without contact between the two. Conduction. This is the transfer of heat from one object to another object with contact. Convection. The transfer of heat away by air movement. Evaporation is the transfer of heat energy when a liquid is changed to a gas. Thinking about the vital signs for Ms. Coburn, what other vital signs should be checked? Our temperature cycle is a cycle of 24 hour period. There are various factors that affect the body temperature. Age, so temperature regulation is unstable in small children until they reach puberty. 
The usual temperature range will gradually drop as an individual approaches older adulthood. An older adult has a narrower range of body temperatures than a younger adult. With exercise, muscle activity requires an increased blood supply and carbohydrates as well as fat breakdown. Any form of exercise increases the metabolism and the heat production, and therefore increases the body temperature. Hormone level. Women generally experience greater fluctuations in body temperature than men. Hormonal variations during the menstrual cycle cause body temperature fluctuations. Circadian rhythm. The body temperature normally changes one half degree to one degree Celsius during a 24 hour period. For stress, both physical and emotional stress will increase the body temperature through hormonal and neural stimulation. Environment influences the body temperature. A fever occurs because the heat loss mechanisms are unable to keep pace with the excessive heat production. This causes an abnormal rise in body temperature. For the body, fever is an important defensive mechanism. This shows the effect of the changing set point of the hypothalamic temperature control during a fever. You can see how the body temperature starts out around 98.6. It gets up to 103 and you can see the various aspects that the patient body will go through and then along the bottom is the time in the hour frame. Two types of thermometers are available for measuring body temperature electronic and disposable. The greatest advantage of electronic thermometers are that their readings will appear in seconds and they're very easy to read. A is an electronic thermometer with a disposable probe. B is an electronic tympanic membrane thermometer. C is a temporal artery thermometer. D is a chemical dot disposable single use thermometer. You have delegated vital signs to assisted personnel. The assistant informs you that the patient has just finished a bowl of hot soup. The nurse's most appropriate advice would be to take a rectal temperature, take the oral temperature as planned, Advise the patient to drink a glass of cold water. Wait 30 minutes and take an oral temperature. The answer is D. The consumption of hot liquids will affect oral temperature readings. Once the nurse determines the diagnosis, they will accurately select the related factor or the etiology. The related factor will allow the nurse to develop and set appropriate patient goals and select appropriate nursing interventions. During the planning process, the nurse will integrate the knowledge gathered from assessment and the patient history to develop an individualized plan of care. The plan of care for a patient with alteration in temperature will include realistic and individualized goals along with relevant outcomes. The severity of a temperature alteration and its effects together with the patient's general health status will influence the nurse's priorities in the patient's care. Safety is always a top priority for the nurse. Patients that are at risk for an imbalanced body temperature require an individualized care plan 
that's directed at maintaining normothermia and reducing risk factors. By assisting the patient to maintain the balance between heat production and heat loss, the nurse promotes the health of patients that are at risk for imbalanced body temperature. When an elevated body temperature develops, the nurse will initiate interventions to treat fever. The objective of the therapy is to increase the heat loss, reduce the heat production, and prevent any complications. A heat stroke is an emergency situation. First aid treatment in a heat stroke is moving the patient to a cooler environment removing excess body clothing, placing cool wet towels over the skin, and using an oscillating fan to increase convective heat loss. Hypothermia is a priority of treatment to prevent further decrease in body temperature. Restorative and continuing care, the nurse will educate the patient that has a fever about the importance of taking and continuing any antibiotics as directed until the course of treatment is completed. Children and older adults are at risk for deficit fluid volume because they can quickly lose large amounts of fluid in proportion to their body weight. The nurse will provide education related to signs of dehydration that include a dry mouth, sunken eyes, and decreased urine output. The nurse will help the patient identify preferred liquids and will encourage oral fluid intake as these are important ongoing nursing interventions. A pulse is the palpating of the blood flow in a peripheral artery. Routinely, the radial artery will be used. That is on the outside of the wrist, right above the thumb. As a student, a nurse should take the pulse for 30 seconds and then multiply, multiply by two. We always need to know how many pulse beats or pulse rate there is in one minute. If it is an apical pulse, which is the point of maximum impulse at the base of the heart, this will be obtained with a stethoscope and the apical pulse is always, always um, gathered for one full minute. When a patient's condition suddenly worsens, a carotid artery site is recommended for quickly finding and assessing the pulse rate. Both radial and apical locations are the most common sites for pulse rate assessment. Pulse rates vary by age. The typical rate for an infant is 120 to 160 beats per minute. The toddler is 90 to 140 beats per minute. The preschooler is 80 to 110 beats per minute. The school age child is 75 to 100 beats per minute. The adolescent is 60 to 90 beats per minute and the adult is 60 to 100 beats per minute. A pulse deficit is an inefficient contraction of the heart that fails to transmit a pulse wave to the peripheral pulse site. To assess a pulse deficit, the nurse and a colleague will assess the radial and the apical pulse rates simultaneously and then compare the rates. The difference between the apical 
pulse and the radial pulse rates is the pulse deficit. Rhythm, a normal rhythm is a regular interval will occur between each pulse or heartbeat. For strength, the normal strength remains the same with each heartbeat. The nurse will document the pulse strength as bounding, which is a four, full or strong, a three, normal and expected, a two, diminished or barely palpable, a one, or absent, which is a zero. Equality, the nurse will assess radial pulses on both sides of the peripheral vascular system, comparing the characteristics of each. So when we assess pulses, we assess both sides of the patient simultaneously because the pulses in both arms or both legs or both feet should be exactly or very similarly the same. The top photo A, this is the diaphragm of the stethoscope, is placed firmly and securely on the chest when auscultating high-pitched lung and bowel sounds. The bottom photo is where the bell is being placed on the skin to hear low-pitched vascular and heart sounds. The pulse assessment will determine the general state of the cardiovascular health and the response of the body to other system imbalances. Tachycardia, bradycardia, and dysrhythmias are assessment findings found for many nursing diagnoses. A patient-centered plan of care is the key to developing an exercise plan to which the patient will adhere and stick with it. The nurse will educate patients about the benefits of exercise and how to measure their heart rate during exercise. You notice that a teenager has an irregular pulse. The best, the best action you should take includes reading the history and physical, assessing the apical pulse rate for one full minute, auscultating for strength and depth of pulse, asking whether the patient feels any palpitations or faintness of breath. The answer is B. If you detect an abnormal rate while palpating a peripheral pulse, the next step is to assess the apical pulse rate. The body's survival depends on the ability of oxygen to reach body cells and carbon dioxide being removed from the cells. Respiration is a mechanism the body uses to exchange these two gases between the atmosphere and the blood and the blood and the cells. Ventilation is the movement of gases in and out of the lungs. Diffusion is the movement of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the alveoli and the red blood cells. Perfusion is the distribution of red blood cells to and from the pulmonary capillaries. Analyzing respiratory efficiency requires integrating the assessment data from all three processes. As a nurse, we assess ventilation by determining respiratory rate, depth, rhythm, and end tidal carbon dioxide value. We assess diffusion and perfusion by determining oxygen saturation, or SpO2. Breathing is generally a passive process. The respiratory center is in the brainstem 
and it regulates the involuntary control of respirations. Adults will normally breathe in a smooth, uninterrupted pattern of 12 to 20 breaths per minute. The nurse will assess respirations immediately after measuring the pulse rate with the hand still on the patient's wrist as it rests over the at chest or the abdomen. For respiratory rate, the nurse will observe a full inspiration and expiration when counting the ventilation or respiratory rate. For ventilation, ventilation or ventilatory depth, the nurse will assess the depth of respirations by observing the degree of excursion or movement of the chest. The nurse will describe the ventilatory movements as deep or shallow, normal or labored. Deep respiration involves a full expansion of the lungs with full exhalation. Ventilatory rhythm. The nurse will determine the breathing pattern by observing the chest or the abdomen. Diaphragmatic breathing results from the contraction and the relaxation of the diaphragm, and it will be observed best by watching abdominal movements. Healthy men and children usually demonstrate diaphragmatic breathing. Women tend to use thoracic muscles to breathe, assessed by observing the movements in their upper chest. For diffusion and perfusion, the nurse will measure the oxygen saturation in the blood. The blood flows through the pulmonary capillaries and delivers red blood cells for oxygen attachment. After oxygen diffuses from the alveoli into the pulmonary blood, most of the oxygen attaches to hemoglobin molecules in the red blood cells. Red blood cells carry the oxygenated hemoglobin molecules through the left side of the heart and out to the peripheral capillaries where the oxygen will detach depending on the needs of the tissues. The percent of the hemoglobin that is bound with oxygen in the arteries is the percent of saturation of hemoglobin, or SAO2. <clears throat> it is usually between 95% and 100%. Saturation rate greater than 93% is acceptable. A saturation rate of less than 90% is a clinical emergency. Values that are obtained with the pulse oximetry system are less accurate at saturation rates less than 70%. Capnography is the measurement of exhaled carbon dioxide through exhalation. At the end of exhalation, the carbon dioxide measurement approximates the PaCO2 in a healthy patient. It is normally 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. Are Ms. Coburn's vital signs within normal limits? The measurement of respiratory rate, pattern, and depth, along with this SpO2, assesses the ventilation the diffusion, and the perfusion. When caring for a patient, we want the patient to have a respiratory rate that is between 12 to 20 breaths per minute, and the patient is breathing smoothly with deep breaths. A postoperative patient is breathing rapidly. You should immediately call the physician, count the respirations, assess the oxygen saturation, ask the patient if he feels uncomfortable.
The answer is C. Shortness of breath is an indicator of hypoxemia. Hypoxemia is a decrease in the oxygenation of the blood. Assessing the oxygen saturation will alert the, no the nurse to know if the patient's breathing status is a result of hypoxemia. Blood pressure is the force that is exerted on the walls of an artery by the pulsing blood that is under pressure from the heart. Systemic or arterial blood pressure. This is blood pressure in the system of arteries in the body. It's a good indicator of cardiovascular health. The blood flows throughout the circulatory system due to pressure changes. The blood moves from an area of high pressure to one of low pressure. Systolic pressure is the peak of maximum pressure when ejection occurs in the heart. Diastolic pressure is when the ventricles relax, the heart fills, and the pressure of the blood in the arteries. Diastolic pressure is the minimum pressure exerted against the arterial walls at all times. The standard unit for measuring blood pressure is millimeters of mercury, or mmHg. The measurement indicates the height to which the blood pressure raises a column of mercury. The nurse will record blood pressure with the systolic reading above the diastolic reading written as a fraction. The difference between the systolic pressure and the diastolic pressure is the pulse pressure. The blood pressure depends on cardiac output. When the volume increases in blood vessels, the pressure in that space rises. As the cardiac output increases, more blood is pumped against the arterial walls. This causes the blood pressure to rise. The blood pressure depends on peripheral vascular resistance. The size of arteries and arterioles changes to adjust the blood flow to the needs of the tissues. The blood pressure depends on the volume of circulating blood. Most adults have a circulating blood volume of 5,000 milliliters. Routinely, the blood volume remains constant. The viscosity is the thickness of the blood. This affects the ease with which the blood flows through small vessels. Hematocrit or percentage of red blood cells in the blood determines the blood viscosity. If the hematocrit rises, the blood flow will slow and the arterial pressure will increase. The heart contracts more forcefully to move viscous blood throughout the circulatory system. Think of viscous blood as syrup pouring from a bottle or honey pouring from a jar. Elasticity. The walls of an artery are elastic and easily distendable. As the pressure within the arteries increases, the diameter of the vessel walls increases to accommodate the pressure change. The ability of arteries to dilate prevents wide fluctuations in blood pressure. Emotional stress and acute pain result in sympathetic stimulation, increases the heart rate, the cardiac output, and the vascular resistance. The effect of the sympathetic simulation will increase the heart, or excuse me, increase the blood pressure. Ethnic and genetic characteristics will influence the blood pressure. Blood pressure varies throughout the day. Lower blood pressure is, happens during sleep between midnight and 3 a.m. Hypertension 
is often asymptomatic, means showing no symptoms. Elevated blood pressure or hypertension is diagnosed in adults when an average of two or more readings on at least two subsequent health visits is above 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury. Hypotension is when the systolic blood pressure falls to 90 millimeters of mercury or below. For many people, low blood pressure is an abnormal finding that is associated with an illness. How would you respond to Ms. Coburn's question when she's talking about her blood pressure being at a rate of 164 over 98 and asking, is that okay? Ms. Coburn obviously has high blood pressure, and as a nurse, we know this can put her at risk for health problems. After she sees the practitioner, her blood pressure should be taken again, and the nurse should suggest lifestyle changes, and these should be discussed with her. Guidelines for proper blood pressure cuff size. The cuff width should be 20% more than the upper arm diameter or 40% of the circumference and two thirds of the arm length. The position during routine blood pressure determination needs to be the same during each measurement to permit a meaningful comparison of values. During initial, initial assessment, obtain and record the blood pressure in both arms. It is normal for there to be a difference of 5 to 10 millimeters of mercury between the right and the left arm. In subsequent assessments, the blood pressure should be measured in the arm that has the higher pressure. Blood pressure differences greater than 10 millimeters of mercury between arms will indicate vascular problems and need to be reported to the healthcare provider. The American Heart Association suggests that blood pressure is recorded in two numbers for measurement. The point on the manometer when the nurse hears the first sound for the systolic measurement and the point on the manometer when the nurse hears the fifth sound for diastolic measurement. Orthost Static hypotension is assessed by obtaining blood pressure and pulse in a sequence with the patient in supine position, sitting position, and standing. Blood pressure readings are taken within three minutes after the patient changes position. In many cases, orthostatic hypotension is detected within a minute of standing. This is an automatic blood pressure monitor. Today, the use of automated electronic oscillometric devices do not require the use of a stethoscope for auscultation. The device includes an electronic monitor with a pressure sensor, a digital display, and an upper arm cuff. There are specific patients that are not appropriate for electronic blood pressure measurements. Patients that have irregular heartbeat, have known hypertension, have peripheral vascular obstruction like clots or narrowed vessels, shivering, patients with seizures, excessive tremors, patients that have the inability to cooperate, or patients that have a blood pressure less than 90 millimeters of mercury systolic.
if the nurse ever suspects that the measurement obtained using an electronic blood pressure monitor is incorrect, the nurse should always use a sphygmo manometer and a stethoscope to obtain a blood pressure reading. The lower extremity blood pressure cuff is positioned above the popliteal artery at mid-thigh with the knee flexed. Blood pressure measurement in ambulatory settings will begin with patients at three years of age during every wellness visit. For healthy children, blood pressure only needs to be measured annually. For lower extremity blood pressure, the nurse needs to position the cuff two and a half centimeters or one inch above the popliteal artery with the bladder over the posterior aspect of the mid thigh. The procedure for lower extremity is identical to brachial artery blood pressure measurement. Systolic pressure in the legs is routinely higher by 10 to 40 millimeters of mercury than in the brachial artery, but the diastolic pressure remains the same. The assessment of blood pressure along with pulse assessment will evaluate the general state of cardiovascular health and the responses to system imbalances. It is important to use teaching strategies to inform Ms. Coburn not only of lifestyle changes that she needs to make, but the reasons why each change is valuable to her health. When assessing the blood pressure of a school-aged child, using an adult cuff of normal size will affect the reading and produce a value that is accurate, indistinct, falsely low, falsely high. The answer is D. Children should only have their blood pressure taken with an appropriately fitting cuff, otherwise it will skew the results. Specifically, if an adult blood pressure cuff is used on a child, the resulting blood pressure will be falsely high. Older adults who have lost upper arm mass, especially the frail elderly, require special attention to the selection of a smaller sized blood pressure cuff. Older adults will sometimes have an increase in systolic pressure related to decreased vessel elasticity, where the diastolic pressure will remain the same, yielding a wider pulse pressure. Instruct older adults to change position slowly and wait with weight after each change to avoid postural hypotension and prevent injuries. Skin of older adults is more fragile and susceptible to cuff pressure during frequent measurements. More frequent assessment of skin under the cuff or rotating blood pressure sites is recommended. Evaluate the outcomes of teaching interventions by having the patient or family explain the importance of blood pressure measurement and blood pressure medication. It is useful to request a demonstration of the blood pressure measurement device for evaluation. What evaluation strategies would you suggest for Ms. Coburn? Demonstrate and observe Ms. Coburn practicing taking her own blood pressure, evaluate her technique, provide guidance as necessary, ask Ms. Coburn to state three risk factors for hypertension,
review Ms. Coburn's walking activities since her last visit, maybe discuss motivators and offer encouragement to continue, ask Ms. Coburn's what salty food she's avoiding and whether or not she needs information about sodium content of foods, could ask Ms. Coburn if she's ready to discuss quitting smoking. When performing vital signs and thinking about transferring equipment from patient to patient, the nurse needs to ensure that she takes alcohol swabs or alcohol prep pads and cleans off her stethoscope between each patient. Also needs to make sure that we decrease the risk for skin breakdown by rotating blood pressure sites that we use. Make sure that we analyze and look at the trends for the vital signs. And we want to make sure that we as nurses consider the patient's health status before we ever delegate um, vital signs to be taken by someone else.